We're in our series about uh, barriers to spiritual growth and, and uh, looked at several different issues. Last week we looked at forgiveness and unforgiveness. This week uh, I want to take a little bit of a different turn on some things and, and uh, talk to you a little bit this morning about trying too hard. And I want you to begin at Colossians chapter 2. You really need your Bibles out today. We're going to look at several verses anyway, and I want you to turn to them. So get Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. It says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus, so walk you in him, or continue to live in him, depending on the version you have. As you receive Christ Jesus, continue to walk in him. Now, obviously, when you look at that verse, you've got to decide, first of all, how did you receive him? Because if you understand how you received him, then you can understand how to walk in him. And Paul obviously looks at the Colossians and assumes that they understand how they got saved, how they became a Christian, so they would know how to walk in him and how to live in him. And, and so you have to begin with, how do you receive Christ and how did you do that? And, you know, the world out there kind of thinks that they're good enough, they'll get to go to heaven. If I do enough good and overcome the bad, the kind of a, you know, a balancing act, if I have enough good, and, and maybe if I just get better, or maybe if I don't do some of the bad things I used to do, those kind of, that kind of balancing and thinking about getting to heaven is kind of, it's, it's actually very uh, foreign to the Bible, that there is in no way God having a balance sheet it is either sin or no sin, if there is a balance sheet. You either have sin or you don't have sin. Those who don't have sin go to heaven. Those who have any sin, one or any, don't go to heaven. That's his balance sheet if you want. And if you want to have something balancing. So in a sense, you can never balance all the sin we have committed with doing good because it doesn't take care of getting rid of the sin that we do. And so when he, Paul begins to talk about what does it mean to receive Christ, then he begins to mean by that, how did you deal with the sin problem you have? And it isn't just the sinning that we have a problem with. It isn't just that we sin. It's that we have a nature that wants to sin. It becomes the natural part of our life. And the Bible calls that our sinful nature and it's because of that sinful nature we stand judged by God already. So you can't stand before God and say, well, I wasn't as bad as someone else, or I, I got a little better. And, and you have to deal with the sinful nature, not just the acts of sin. So you could say, I got better, or you could say, I'm not doing as many sins as before. And why can't God just look at that and say, well, you're trying hard, and that's good. Uh, because God's not interested in you trying hard. He's interested in you getting rid of the sin and it not being present in your life. And he wants you to get rid of that sinful nature or he can't take you to be with him. So salvation becomes God taking care of that sinful nature in us. And being dead to that is how we live. And so when you gave your life to Christ, what you did is you said, God, I have this sinful nature that I sin just out of, it's just natural for me. When someone does something mean to me, it is natural for me to get upset. It's natural for me to just um, not do uh, the right thing. It's natural for me to retaliate. It's natural for me to be angry. It's natural for me to get grumpy. You know how fast kids get an attitude today? You know, it's like kids seem to be born with an attitude. And it goes all the way through school and all the way through high school, and then young adults, they just have an attitude about them. You know, and you tell a kid, cut the attitude. What? And they just give you more attitude, you know. What is that attitude? Well, it's the sinful nature. It is the wrong response to what's right. And that sinful nature has to be taken care of. So when the Bible says, as you receive Christ Jesus, you have to say, how do I take care of my sinful nature? I gave my life to Christ. I asked him to forgive me of my sins. I asked him to take me into himself, into his, into his family, and he put his Holy Spirit in me. Now I have a new life in Christ. Now it's not me who lives, but Christ who lives. Now I have this new nature that never sins. That's what goes to heaven. And if you don't have a new nature, 
you don't go to heaven no matter how good you try to be. Now, if you take that, giving faith, putting faith in Christ and say, now, I walk that way, I live that way, then you can't try to live the Christian life and you can't work at it in, in, in the sense of, I'm really trying hard to do good. I'm trying hard not to get angry. I'm trying hard not to, to do this. I'm trying hard to quit this. I'm trying really hard. You will just get, get overwhelmed and sucked in and drown. When I was a young boy in uh, Windsor, Canada, uh, the Detroit River was polluted and you didn't go swimming in the Detroit River. They have since cleaned it, and you can actually swim in it now. But when I was growing up, you did not go, you didn't even catch fish in there. It was so nasty because the fish ate the things that were in there. It was just nasty. But there was this one kid that decided he would go swimming in a certain part in the Detroit River, and it was not, it was barely waist, chest high on him, and he drowned. And we could never, uh, you know, I remember as a kid thinking, how do you drown in water up to your chest? How do you do that? Well, he happened to be in an area that had a lot of, it isn't seaweed, but it was grassy stuff in the river. And it was a shallow area. And it was like seaweed. And they say when, you, when you're in seaweed or this kind of lily pad stuff and you begin to thrash around, it actually gets tighter around you. And the more you work and the harder you fight, the, the worse it entangles you until it pulled him under and drowned him. Now, I contend to you that the Christian life for a lot of people becomes seaweed, that the more you struggle, the more you fight, the more you try, the worse it gets, not the easier it gets. The worse it gets. Because trying always replaces trusting. And trusting is how you win in the Christian life. If you got saved by faith, then you also walk by faith. It is Christ who is at work in you, not you who work hard. Now you're going to respond with, well, wait a minute, are you telling me I'm not supposed to try anything? I'm just supposed to sit here and look like a bump on the log here? Am I just supposed to... No, but you have to do it the right way. You have to work the right way. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. Just a few pages over and look at Galatians chapter 3. And I want you to see what Paul says to these Galatians. These Galatians have been saved by faith. And if you know the book of Galatians at all, you know that this is kind of Paul's description of what it means to walk by faith. And, and uh, the justification by faith in the book of Galatians is a theme in it. And in chapter 3, he begins to talk to them about some things. And, and, you know, this is a great pastor because he says, in the very first verse in chapter 3 of Galatians, he says, you foolish Galatians. Now, wouldn't it be nice if I just got up Sunday morning and said, you bunch of idiots. I mean, how many people would sit there and go, well, that's insulting. Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. But the problem is, for a lot of people, it's exactly what it is. Are you crazy? That's what he's saying. Are you crazy? Are you foolish, so foolish? Who has bewitched you? You know what bewitched means? Mesmerized. Who's, who has bewitched you? Who has taken over your mind? What's wrong with you? Sometimes you look at your kids and think, what is wrong with you? What were you thinking? You know, and, and you'll respond to them, uh, I don't think he was thinking anything. He's bewitched. He's out of his mind. He's foolish. He's an idiot. What are you thinking? So you, you crazy grace people, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing of faith? How did you get saved? Was it because you tried hard? Was it because you did the rules? Or did you, do, did you get saved by faith? And obviously the answer that's implied is, I got, I got saved by faith. I put my faith in Jesus. I realized there was no hope. You see, it, when you understand that there is no hope outside of Jesus, that the only way you can come to Christ is by faith in him, absolute surrender to him, and absolute dependence on him, 
That's what faith is. When you realize that you can grab a hold of forgiveness by faith, you, don't, you can't do anything. What are you going to do to save yourself? You can't do anything about it. You have to depend on Jesus. And Paul knew that, and he said, did you get saved by your hard work, or did you get saved by faith? And so the, imp the implication is by faith. Verse 3 then says, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he then who provides you with a spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by the hearing with faith? And he's saying it's by faith. Now I'm going to suggest to you that what happens in the Christian life in maturing is that when we try hard, we end up frustrated. And if you have frustration in your life, it's because you're not believing, you are trying. And it'll always get you frustrated. Some people, in order to deal with their frustration, they just uh, redefine the goal and they just say, well, this is the way I am and this is the way life is going to be. And I guess, I guess the preacher talks in those platitudes that it's not my life and I'm, I'm not going to make it. And uh, you know what? I'm kind of satisfied. I'm not all that bad. I'm not that good. But I'm not all that bad and I'm going to heaven. So what's the difference? I'll just kind of cope with my problems and, and get by and doing a little better, cleaned up a little bit, so I'm okay. And some people get cleaned up a little bit and think that that's the goal, and it is not the goal. The goal is to be like Jesus and to walk by faith daily and to trust him in everything. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 11. And look what Paul says about, uh, Paul, Jesus says about this Christian life and how we are supposed to live it. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 30. Well, verse 29. Let's start at 29. So Matthew chapter 11 and verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Take my yoke. Now, yoke is the part where a person controls an animal. It's what they put on him to pull. They put it around the horse's neck and it pulls things with and he says, take on me the yoke. Now, the question is, when they get the yoke on, is it hard or is it easy? For most people, the yoke is hard. It's a burden. I got to quit this. I got to stop that. I got to do this. I got to read every day. I got to read a book. The preacher keeps talking about things I got to read and memorize and do. This is all work. This is hard. I got to stop responding out of my old nature. What? I'm used to that. I'm used to telling people, giving a piece of my mind to somebody. I'm used to setting people straight. I'm used. This is the way I live. This is the way I am. This is hard work. All right? But what does Jesus say in verse 30? He says, my yoke is easy. And my load is light. Now, what's the problem? Why is it so hard for us when Jesus said it's easy and it's light? But you talk to most Christians, and the Christian life is a burden that's heavy, and it's a yoke that is hard. Hard. And you get frustrated, stressed out, overworked and life doesn't seem happy at all <coughs> see spiritual maturity does take discipline it does take discipline but if discipline for you is a bad word you'll always have trouble it will continue to be a struggle for you now, I, you know, I, I don't know what happened to me when I was a kid, but I grew up hating going to bed. Hated it. Darren and I, we've talked about this a little bit, you know. We just kind of look at the bed and go, uh-uh, I don't want to go there. I don't know, maybe my parents sent me there as a discipline, I don't know. But I just used to think, I don't want to go to bed, I could miss something. I don't want to miss anything, you know. 
So I want to stay up as late as I can. I'm not sure why. When I was a kid, you know, all that came on at midnight was, mm, you know, everything was off. Nothing was on television. Now, my goodness, you can watch anything you want any time of the day. But I, I hated it. It was hard for me. There are people who look at the Christian life just the same way. It's just hard. And I'm going to suggest to you that you cannot live this life. This is a life we live by faith. And if you try, you will miss the joy. You will miss the joy. Now turn with me to John chapter 12. And I want you to see what, what Jesus says about the Christian life. Chapter 12 and verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. Jesus, in these few words, as he's talking about what it means to be in the kingdom, what it means to be a person who is a follower of him, says that dying precedes living. Now, we all know that. I look at my yard. I see the patches. We put some seed down, been watering it every day. Right now, there are little furry, little green things coming up out of the ground. But a couple of weeks ago, they were just seeds. And until those seeds were thrown in the ground, put a little dirt, nourished, and they go into the ground and die, no grass comes up. No corn comes up until you plant one corn. What's neat about corn is you plant one seed and you get lots, of more, lots more of them, hundreds of them. And it's true in the Christian life. Until you die, you cannot live this life. And until you say, I die daily like Paul did, and Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 31 says, I die daily, you will, be, you will have these kinds of signs. You will have anger. You'll get upset with events. You'll get upset with people. You'll get distressed with situations. You'll get... Um, irritable, you'll get testy at times, you'll have an attitude, you'll have unforgiveness, it's a mark that just seems to come, you know, oh, I guess I better deal with that again, I've let it all build up again. You'll have habitual patterns in your life of habits of the way you do things and the way you respond that aren't biblical and aren't godly. You'll be inconsistent in your spiritual walk. You'll be good one day, bad the next, good for a week, bad for two, good for a few days, and you'll blame it on the food, and you'll blame it on your husband, your wife, you'll blame it on somebody, but it'll always be this inconsistency. There'll be a lack of a sense of satisfaction in the Christian life. There'll always be this lack of content of saying, you know what? Following Jesus is a good thing. I love, I love him. Yeah, being a Christian, this is the greatest thing ever. You won't be able to say that because it's such a battle going on, and that's because you haven't died yet. And dead men don't have those things. Dead men and women live for Jesus. That's all that matters. All that matters is the kingdom. You know, when it's all said and done, people, when it's all said and done, and we die, and we go stand before the Lord, all that's going to matter is what you did for Jesus. All that matters. All that's going to matter is how you loved him and served him, how you obeyed him, how you followed him. That's all that matters. So, you know, if trouble comes your way, what does it matter? God has brought that into your life so you could be more like him, so the kingdom would be shown in your life. We have a video series that we want you to see it sometime. 
Uh, did we bring it? Did we bring it this morning? Um, uh, sacred Marriage? There's a video we have called Sacred Marriage. Um, there's a book. The video is excellent. And I'll give you the premise of the, book, uh, the video in the book, and then you can watch it. It is basically God has given you, your husband, your wife, your family, your situation to make you like Jesus. Quit complaining. Quit complaining. You know what happens to complainers? They just get more. There was an old song that, uh, I, I, you know, I think it was Andre Crouch wrote, Take Another Trip Around Mount Sinai. Wasn't it Andre Crouch? I don't know. It was years ago anyway. He said, you haven't figured this out yet? Take another trip. You know, the children of Israel, when they're out in the wilderness, they kept complaining, take another trip. Forty years of griping and complaining, and finally those that didn't gripe and complain got to go in. Forty years of complaining, take another trip. Some of you, take another trip until you get this right, that your trouble is there to make you like Jesus. When you try too hard, your trouble is trouble for you. When you see Jesus in them and you die to the trouble and you die to yourself and all that matters is the kingdom and all that matters is what he wants, then everything that comes your way is an opportunity for you to grow spiritually. That's what dead people do when they see trouble. They see opportunity for spiritual growth. You want things better? Cut it out. Just cut it out. What you want is to be more like Jesus. That's a person who's died to themselves. What I want is what Jesus wants. What I want is my life better in the kingdom. Now, last night, I watched part of a baseball game. I could not watch the end. You know, when you're in the, at the uh, American League Championship Series and you lose 15 to 5, things did not go well for Detroit last night. And I looked at that and I said, yeah, well, most of my life, they haven't done much. <laughs> anyway, don't, but listen, people, what does it matter? I mean, what does it matter? If St. Louis wins today, fine. They can go on, they can go on to the, the World Series and they can, they can beat the Texas Rangers. That would be just fine. But you know, when it comes to the kingdom, does that even come close to mattering? And the answer is no, not even close. Now, would I like to see Detroit win? Well, yeah. All my life I've been praying. <laughs> and the Lord keeps saying, I'm not listening. Because <laughs> it doesn't matter. It just doesn't mean anything. And so much in our lives don't mean it, doesn't mean anything. So much of what goes on in our lives, it just doesn't mean anything. Significant. And so when you have trouble in your relationships, when you have trouble in your family, when you have trouble in job, trouble in your finances, those are just opportunities for God to show you how you can trust him, how you can depend on him, how you can go through it all, how you can make it through it, because it's about the kingdom. Now, if your eyes are focused on this world, listen to what Jesus said. Look, look at that verse again, chapter 12 and verse uh, 25. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world shall keep it life eternal. What does it mean to hate this life? Well, it's in, in a sense of loving and hating, it's that it, there are things that just don't matter. There isn't anyone in this room who's a millionaire, I don't think. If you are, you're not tithing. <laughs> that much I know. You know, none of us are millionaires. You know, and what does it matter if you have a million dollars and not going to heaven? What does it matter if you have lots of stuff but don't get to heaven? I mean, I'm, I'm working on eternity, not on this 20, 30 years I might have left to live in this life. I'm looking for eternity. I'm putting my treasures in heaven. That's where we put our treasures. But when you're alive to this world, this is all that matters. What you have, what you don't have, how much you have, how much you don't have. Those things all matter in this world. But for a Christian, they shouldn't matter. Now, I'm not saying don't work, and I'm not saying don't make a lot of money. I'm not saying that at all. 
but keep your mind on what's heaven. Keep your mind on what's real. That's first. That's why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all this stuff will be added unto you. It's about dying instead of living. It's about saying, it's not me, but it's Christ. Now turn with me to Galatians chapter 2. If you are going to grow spiritually, if you're going to become more like Christ, if the kingdom is going to matter most in your life, then this verse, do we even have this on the memory list? Verse 20? It's not on the list. This is bad that it's not on our list. Who put that list together, Roger? <clears throat> this should be on the list. Uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I have been, well, it depends on which version you read. Um, if you read King James, I am crucified with Christ, it says. But if you read New, uh, uh, New American Standard, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. So I am crucified with Christ, this King James. And you think about that, you think, well, when did Jesus die? Well, he died two, roughly 2,000 years ago. And yet this says I was crucified with him, but I wasn't alive. So how was I crucified with him? We call this positional truth. It is that when God looked at Jesus, he saw you on that cross. He saw your sin on that cross. He saw that sinful nature you have and that I have. He saw that on the cross. And if you want to grow spiritually, you're going to have to accept that as a reality, as a truth that is irrevocable, in a sense, as a truth that you cannot get past, but a truth that controls your day. I have already been crucified with Christ. That's something we believe to be true. Now, when, when you believe something, honestly believe it, not just know it, but really believe it, if you believe that a Ford is a better built car than anything else and you buy a GM product, you don't really believe it. But if you believe that a Ford is the car that everyone should have and it's the best built machine in the world, then you buy one and you put your money where your mouth is, right? When you think Krispy Kremes are the best donuts in the world, you don't go to Harry's Donut Shop. You go to Krispy Kreme. If you believe that you can do mathematics, then you do it. And if you believe you can't, you can't. The real problem in the Christian church is not activity, it's bad believing. You don't really believe it. Because when you believe it, you act on it. You understand? If you really believe your old nature is crucified with Christ, then you act on it. And you get up in the morning and say, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I. Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. I am crucified with Christ. It's not I, but it's Christ. If you want a little phrase, it is not I, but Christ. And you ought to think of that every morning. Not I, but Christ. It's not I who live, it's he who lives. Would Jesus go into this place? Would Jesus put that into his stomach? Would Jesus say that? Would Jesus respond that way? It's not I, it's Christ who lives. Whoa, wait a minute. If I really believe that, my actions follow that. So the real problem comes, what do you really believe? to be true. Because if you really believe you're crucified with Christ, and it's not you who lives, but it's Christ who lives, then you can start trusting and watching God work in you if you really believe it's he who works. But if you don't really believe it, you will try really hard, and you will get frustrated, and you'll get discouraged, and you'll get disappointed, and you'll get upset, and you will throw up your hands and say, oh, well, can't be done, and you'll quit. Now, the church is full of, sad to say, but the church is full of a lot of people who don't know Jesus, and it's full of a lot of people who don't believe what he has said, and they act it out. And you just kind of go, 
whoa, you really think that that way to talk is really right? You really think that the way you're acting is really what God wants? Well, they don't know, and they don't care. And the church is full of that. It's why the world looks at the church and says, who wants that? We don't live as if we're dead people. We live very much alive to our old nature and let it rule us. And so the world says, well, who needs that? Just another set of rules and regulations to live by? I thought being a, jo- a Christian was supposed to be joyful. I thought following Jesus was supposed to be the adventure of a lifetime. This is an adventure. This is a journey. This is exciting. This following Jesus thing is the greatest thing that ever happened to a person. So why are so many Christians so frustrated and so upset and so incapable and so impoverished? Because they don't really believe it. They don't really believe they're dead to sin. They don't really believe that they've been crucified with Christ. They don't really believe that. And we act on what we really believe. So you have to look at what do you really believe. You know, what's interesting is we all could sit here and give up theological positions on lots of things. But what you really believe is measured by how you live, not by what you say. And so you evaluate what you believe by how are you living? How's it going? Is it working out for you? Is it working for you? This people, this is the time for you to say, hey, it's not me who lives. It's supposed to be Jesus. I'm supposed to believe he died for me and that he lives in me and I don't have to sin and I don't have to live this life. He lives this life. This is a matter of faith. How in the world can I prove to you this morning that Jesus and you were crucified 2,000 years ago? How can I prove that to you? How can I show it to you? How can I reveal that to you? I cannot. You have to believe it by faith. You have to actually say, I just trust what God has said in his word. It said I was crucified with Christ, and I trust his word. I trust what he has said. I believe it's true. I am dead to sin. I don't have to do this. This is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is God doing it. Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is God in the midst of you who gives you the joy, who gives you the ability. It's Christ in you who accomplishes it. It is Christ who does it all. And then in the end, who gets the glory? You do. No, he does. That's why it can't be your hard work. That's why it can't be you. It has to be him. Because in the end, all we are is vessels for him to live his life through. All we are is people that say, oh God, without you I'm hopeless. Oh God, if you don't work in my heart, I'm going to be a rotten person. God, if you don't do something in me, I'm going to be just like every other person. God, if you don't do it, it can't be done. And so when it's done and you actually respond right and you have a changed life and things are a lot better and you're full of joy, you can say, oh God, it's only because of you. That's how he designed it, so that he gets the glory in our lives, not us. So if you're looking so that you can get a pat on the back, Christianity is not about you getting a pat on the back. If you want a pat on the back, go to the world, they'll do it for you. Because that's what the world's way is. You want people to tell you how wonderful you are, go to the world. You want, as a Christian, for God to say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's the pat in the back I'm looking for. You see, a lot of us, if not all of us, are good manipulators to get other people to tell us we're okay. I mean, I can do that. But what I really want is to Jesus, for Jesus to say, well done. And that only comes by faith. That only comes by trusting him. That will only come. Listen, in church, The one who gets the glory is Jesus. Now, we all need encouraging, right? I mean, we do. God's made us that way. We need to pat each other in back and say, hey, I just want you to know I'm really proud of you. Glad, I'm so proud of you memorizing your scripture. Uh, So glad you've been reading. I'm so glad you're working on your, your, um, uh, uh, your life builders I'm so I'm so proud of you that's just great and man I just I'm so I watched Jesus through you and your trouble I'm so glad of that but in the end it is Jesus 
to whom we give glory. Now, we need to encourage each other, but the glory goes to him. And if you try to take the glory, you really take his place, and you steal from him. As Christians, we don't want to steal from our Father. We want to steal the glory. We want to give him the glory. So whatever happens in our life, what we want is Jesus to receive glory and honor in our lives. No one else. That only comes by believing you are crucified with Christ. That you don't live, he lives. And only he lives. Now this morning, what are you going to do with that? If you want to grow spiritually, you're going to have to say, this life is not about me. This is about him. If you want to grow spiritually, you're going to have to start saying, I need to die daily. Paul said, I, in 1531, 1 Corinthians, I die daily, every day. Paul had to get up every day and say, it's not I, but Christ. Can you remember that phrase? Not I, but Christ. There's an excellent book by that title, Not I, But Christ. Uh, I'm trying to think it was um, Watchman Nee or Andrew Murray. Get any book by Andrew Murray would be excellent on the life of Christ. Andrew Murray, anything you can read by him would be excellent on this issue. Uh, Watch Me Knee wrote a book called Not I But Christ. It is about him living. Quit trying and start trusting. Start depending on him. Okay, let's bow our heads and let's pray.